Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to the Core Modeling webinar series. I, on behalf of Al and Martin, uh, would like to thank you all for accepting our invitation and participating on the webinar today. Uh, as we have mentioned in our previous communication, uh, most of our meetings, they have been on the mechanics of the work. Uh, so we wanted to get back uh, in the Martin's world to the excitement of doing science and discuss more on scientific advances that each of the core modeling team is making in this uh, webinar series. Uh, for your information, uh, we have eight different themes in core modeling uh, who are working on different topics uh, such as uh, special meteorological forcing data, a Jewish special intelligence, current generation hydrological modeling, next generation hydrological modeling, hydrological forecasting, water resources management, water quality, and hydroeconomics. Uh, today, we'll be hearing from the current generation hydrological modeling team. Uh, the rest of the themes, uh, they will be presenting uh, their science advances uh, in the subsequent webinars. So please stay tuned. Uh, the webinar today, it will run for an hour. Uh, it will consist of about 45 minutes of presentation, uh, which will be followed by 15 minutes of question and answer session. Uh, but you do not need to wait till the end to ask any question. Uh, you can type in your question anytime during the presentation and I will relay them uh, to the speaker at the end. Uh, uh, please note that uh, the attendees will be muted, so you will have to type in your question. Uh, all right, uh, that was the housekeeping. Uh, today we have Dr. Bruce Davison from Environment and Climate Science Canada to kick off our webinar series. Uh, Bruce is a theme leader of the current generation hydrological modeling theme. Uh, this theme, among others, uh, focuses on moral improvement, provides moral support, and will generate climate change production run for all major river basins in Canada. Uh, Bruce, we are happy and grateful to have you here today. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Pravin, for that introduction. And uh, I just want to start by thanking everybody who's joining on the webinar today. I know things are quite busy and, and uh, with uh, the pandemic uh, underway, it's uh, um, we're all spending lots of time on these sorts of Zoom sessions, so I do appreciate the fact that you're taking the time to join us today uh, for this presentation. Um, I'm just going to try and share my screen here. Uh, so, Pravin, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Sorry, we've got this little technical glitch to deal with, I think. There we go. Um, so if I just share my screen, okay. All right, so uh, just to check in here, Pravin, can you see what uh, the, the title page here for my presentation? Uh, yes, I can see it. Okay, so I'll assume everybody else can see it as well. Um, yeah, as Pravin mentioned, this is the topic of uh, advances in the current generation hydrological modeling, which is a subgroup of the core modeling team, uh, which is a part of the Global, uh, Global Water Futures Program. So I, I'm presenting today, but uh, really I'm presenting the work of a number of other individuals who are, who are part of the group, and I'll provide a bit of an introduction to those individuals in, uh, in a moment. Um, but I want to start with... Um, indicating what it is that we're focusing on within this particular uh, subgroup of, um, of core modeling. And it really boils down to, to three things. Um, we're looking at producing uh, um, one of the, the key GWF deliverables, which are uh, labeled here as climate change production runs over seven major drainage basins across, across the country. Uh, we're also looking to upgrade the current generation hydrological models with well-established hydrological science. Uh, this is something that um, I've been involved with for uh, the last 20 years or so, and it's really exciting to see uh, the um, improvements in the collaboration between the process hydrolog hydrological uh, hydrologists, between process hydrologists and the hydrological modelers that is occurring at the moment and uh, there's some real advancements that are occurring on the modeling uh, front simply by uh, taking some well-established hydrological science and incorporating them into the um, uh, into the modeling platforms. The third uh, uh, goal of this group is to support um, Global Water Futures model users particularly with MESH and uh, CRIM uh, so we do have a couple of individuals tagged as the frontline support people for those two models. 
uh, as well. In terms of the people who are involved, I uh, just have a list here of our, our current team members. Um, some have been uh, with us for some time and some are uh, some left and have come back and uh, some are, are just uh, starting up. So uh, I'll be presenting the, the work of um, uh, a number of the people here, particularly Mohammed, Fuad, Zalalem, some work that Sujata is picking up from uh, um, work that uh, Carl's group had done earlier as well. I'll be presenting a little bit on the, the work that uh, Logan has done with uh, with Prim, uh, Ala uh, and uh, Chang Huang. Uh, they've both really just started with us in the in the last month, uh, so they'll be. Um, uh, uh, we're really excited to get them on board, but there's not uh, much of their work that I'll be presenting today. Lucas has also started with uh, with the team fairly recently, working on the Fraser Basin with the Hype model. And uh, we're expecting uh, uh, Mazda to uh, join us on November the 1st. Uh, I've also listed the faculty leads um, here who are providing uh, direction and support to the, uh, to the team members. And uh, we have a number of collaborators I've listed here. I know there's a few that I've probably forgotten or uh, didn't, uh, neglected uh, to include on the collaborators list. So I, if you don't see your name there, I do apologize. But um, uh, there's a number of people we're sort of touching base with on specific bits and pieces with respect to the current generation hydrological modeling team. And then I've been tagged as the faculty theme lead as the, um, uh, with my adjunct status at the, at the University of Saskatchewan. I, I'm going to, sorry, I'll skip, go back uh, one slide here. Um, I'm going to go through each of these. Uh, there's not a whole lot to say with respect to supporting the Global Water Futures model users other than there are people in place to help with that. Uh, most of the presentation is going to be focusing on some of the upgrades to the current generation hydrological models, uh, some of which predates GWF and GWF has picked up and, and carried on and then uh, really end up with what we're looking to do for the climate change production runs and where we're at with some of those climate change production runs. Uh, that's an activity that is really um, just starting up across the, across the country. As far as upgrading the models uh, goes, the focus here really is on, on mesh. I'll be talking a little bit about some of the water management upgrades that uh, in particular FUAD has been uh, developing over the last few years and are now implemented and being tested in a number of areas across the country. Uh, glacier upgrades are a very active area of research right now and um, I, there's a, a number of people who have been uh, working with that so I'll be presenting some of that work. Uh, mountain, uh, well I guess upgrades to how the how the model can accurately uh, represent uh, hydrological processes in mountainous environments is an area that it's had um, a particular uh, focus, um, particularly the work that Zalalem has done on, on that front. There's also been some work um, particularly with Carl Eric Lindenschmidt's group with uh, coupling mesh with water quality models and ice jam uh, forecasting models. Uh, I won't be talking too much about the ice jam forecasting uh, since we're more focused on the climate change stuff, but just highlighting it here that these are some of the things that have been occurring. Uh, there's also, again, some of this predates GWF uh, quite a ways in terms of improving the representation of the lateral flows uh, within, the, um, uh, within the model. Uh, starting with Watroth that uh, really got off the ground 20 years ago under the uh, um, the umbrella of the, the late uh, Rick Sulis, who was at the University of Waterloo. Um, but there are a number of other algorithms that have been developed to particularly look at the lateral flow processes on um, uh, prairie environments and uh, other fill and spill uh, environments as well. Uh, and uh, that's some of the work that uh, was under Howard Weider and uh, Mullen McConan had to implement it within MeSH. Uh, and then LATFLOW is another algorithm that really takes the best of Watt-Roth and PDM-Roth and puts it together. 
Unfortunately, there isn't a, an academic publication of that. It's still sitting in the grade literature in a, in a master's thesis, but um, uh, that's an algorithm that is available in the model as well. And then some of you will remember Matt McDonald, who implemented the prairie blowing snow model in, um, in mesh. Um, it's now being used uh, in mountainous environments as well. So uh, we do have a, a way of representing some of these lateral cold regions processes that um, is not typical of, of land surface schemes in particular. Uh, there's a number of coming upgrades I uh, just want to touch on briefly here. Uh, uh, Mohammed Al Shami has been doing a lot of work looking at how permafrost is represented in the in the mesh model. Um, we do have with uh, with um, Chan Huang working with David Rudolph uh, looking at some uh, well established methods of um, coupling uh, land surface schemes with groundwater models, and um, uh, we do have a number of groundwater. Uh, options available to us uh, within the mesh modeling platform so we're uh, looking to do a, a really thorough evaluation of, of what's available now and how we can improve the options for looking at different problems down the, down the road. Uh, we also have had on our to-do list for some time uh, improving the representation of the, of the lakes um, both in terms of the lateral and the vertical fluxes and that's some work that is ongoing. It's a little bit on the back burner right now, but um, that's something that's happening through Environment and Climate Change Canada. I know most of you are probably familiar with MeSH, but uh, for those who aren't, um, I just want to highlight here, we do have um, uh, this schematic that we've been showing for years and years. Uh, there's really two um, models like MeSH that we're working with uh, within Environment and Climate Change Canada. One is called GEM Hydro and one is, is MeSH. They both have a land surface scheme coupled with um, a hydrological routing model. There's some important differences between these two systems within Environment and Climate Change Canada. GEM Hydro is really much more geared towards short-term uh, hydrologic prediction. Uh, it can be run in a fully coupled mode with the atmospheric model. Uh, but it's not as scalable or easily used outside of um, Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, MeSH also, uh, and I know this is improving within the land surface scheme within uh, GEM Hydro as well, but um, uh, we do have a fairly robust uh, set of uh, cold regions processes that have been incorporated into the MeSH modeling platform. Uh, particularly within uh, the context of uh, the, the Canadian land surface scheme as well, which is more suitable for the climate change work that we want to do under this um, particular set of work that uh, uh, we're doing with the current generation modeling team. Uh, there's a publication in uh, 20, uh, 2007 that uh, summarizes MeSH at that time. There's quite a bit of work that's happened since then and we really do need to update that publication. It's been on the back burner for me for a number of years and hopefully something I can put on the front burner in the next few months again. Um, this particular slide, uh, I, I won't go into the details here, this is just a representation of the land surface scheme. I should mention this is a slide that Fuad Yassin put together and it's a really nice way of summarizing the, the MeSH framework. Um, again, there, there, there's uh, seven climate forcings that we need to run the MeSH model. Most hydrological models only work with temperature and precipitation, but we actually have a full energy balance, which is typical of the land surface schemes uh, that were primarily generated as lower boundary conditions for the atmospheric models. Um, we also have uh, lot ROF and PDM ROF, which I mentioned earlier, as a within grid process, um, and then the river routing from one grid to the next. So, MeSH as a framework is what we call a semi distributed modeling platform where you essentially carve your basin up into grids, and each grid acts as a, as a mini sub basin, and then uh, within each grid, you have um, grouped response units. And within each group response units, you have the land surface green scheme, which uh, deals with the, the um, lateral fluxes of uh, energy and, and mass between the land surface and the atmosphere. 
Uh, we, what we have are what we call sort of our within grid horizontal flexes. So our blowing snow, for example, and um, lateral flows of water to the stream flow network. Um, and then our between grid processes where you're moving water from one grid to the, to the next. So one of the um, uh, big upgrades that has occurred uh, in recent years is with respect to water management. And this is the work that Fuad has been leading uh, as part of his PhD and as a, as a postdoc with respect to mesh anyway. Uh, so now we have a way of representing um, reservoirs uh, in a, in a new way, uh, there was a, a two methods of rep representing reservoirs in mesh previously based on what uh, was available in rock flood, uh, and that's suitable for certain applications, but certainly not for many of the applications that we're interested in. Uh, so Fuad developed a new reservoir model, and I won't go into the details of how that like how that reservoir model works, just because there's a lot I really want to cover today. But we also have a uh, representation of um, irrigation, both demand and supply management. Uh, so instead of it being just a one-way street to the move the water to the stream flow network um, and then flow to the outlet of the basin, uh, if you're in an area where you actually have a demand for irrigation and irrigation infrastructure, you can move the water from the stream flow back to the land surface scheme uh, to be applied to the land surface scheme again. And um, that creates a really uh, unique feedback from the perspective of land surface schemes. So with the reservoir model and the, um, the possibility of diversions also being included in mesh, this is one of the areas that um, has been uh, um, upgraded within the, the, this particular current generation modeling platform. Uh, in terms of lateral flow representations, I've talked briefly about Watt ROF and PDM ROF. Um, one of the advancements I do want to mention here, and it seems like such a simple thing, and it, at the end of the day, it really was a simple thing. Um, Watt ROF is an algorithm that, that works in many environments, but not in prairie environments or environments where there are strong fill and spill processes. That's where PDM ROF really comes into play. Um, and previously, you could you choose one algorithm or the other. Um, but being a semi-distributed model, it really makes sense to be able to choose the algorithm that you want to use, depending on which uh, grid you're on. So you can see for the Saskatchewan River Basin here in that bottom right-hand map, uh, you can use PDM ROF for areas that are typically not contributing to the basin uh, of the stream flow. Uh, and you can use Watt ROF for the other areas that typically are contributing to, to stream flow. So this is something that was implemented and is in the setup that Huad is using for the Saskatchewan River Basin. I want to switch over from water management to glaciers here. And, and Abbas has been doing some uh, really great work um, on this front. And there's other people that have been working with Abbas and testing out uh, um, the uh, sort of new parameterization and representation of glaciers within mesh. Uh, I really liked how Abba summarized his work here. The objectives are really threefold from the work that he is um, presenting. He wanted to simulate the snow accumulation and ablation in complex mountain environments um, and looking at the glacier energy and mass, mass balance using, using mesh and really diagnosing and describing and evaluating the parameterization for glaciers within the Canadian land surface scheme within MESH and evaluating the model performance and coming up with recommendations for improving model structure, process representation, and parameterization. And one of the things that we discovered in this process is that um, uh, within the Canadian land surface scheme, there has been a representation of glaciers for some time, uh, so that part's not new, but because it was uh, really developed for low, lower boundary conditions for global climate models initially, the representation of glaciers and mesh was really more focused to uh, Greenland and Antarctica, and the uh, parameters for Greenland and Antarctica are really quite different than they are for um, inland glaciers, like in the, in the Rocky Mountains, for example. Um, so 
uh, one thing that Abbas did is he um, uh, he took all the all the new improvements to mesh and uh, had a, a setup um, for a mountainous environment to evaluate the energetics uh, for the snow and, and the glaciers using different parameterizations and, and parameter sets. So these, uh, the second and third bullets here are um, really related to what we're calling mountain mesh. So adjustments for lapse rate and changes in elevation for temperature, precipitation, pressure and humidity, as well as correcting long wave uh, and short wave radiation really in um, rugged terrains and mountainous environments for uh, areas where your forcing that's coming from atmospheric models or reanalysis products might be over a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer grid or 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer grid. And when you apply those over mountainous terrain, it's really not appropriate and you need to make adjustments to these forcing variables based on that. So this is work that Zalalem uh, Tesma did and has been implemented by the work that Abbas has, has done. Uh, in addition, uh, he incorporated the blowing snow algorithm that Matt McDonald put in, uh, looking at sublimation and snow redistribution by wind, um, and uh, evaluating the um, energy fluxes by uh, setting up the model with uh, GRUs that had never been really set up before. Um, so having grouped response units for exposed ice, glacier, the glacier toe, fern, and the accumulation zone. So um, making use of the GRU concept in a really unique way that is really appropriate for environments that have in, inland glaciers associated with them. So just one slide showing some of the results he was getting at uh, the Marmot Creek Research Basin in uh, two areas, um, Facera Ridge and the, and the Hay Meadow um, from 2005 to 2015. The black line represents the observations of the um, uh, the snow height or the snow depth um, in each of these locations and then the red line represents the simulations um, of those results. So uh, that uh, shows generally um, much better than you would expect from a typical hydrological model. So incorporating a lot of these improvements really makes a, makes a difference. Uh, this is another slide showing the uh, um, comparing observations from the World Glacier Monitoring Service and the glacier mass balance at, at Pato Glacier and the uh, simulations um, coming from the model setup as well. So there's still room for improvement. It's not perfect, but uh, generally capturing the, um, the cyclical nature of the, uh, the glacier mass balance um, from one year to the next. Uh, here again, we're showing the, the uh, runoff simulations from the mesh class setup compared to the observations at the Pato Glacier. Uh, so there's there's maybe some still some work to do here, but some uh, uh, there's some reasonable results coming from from this work. So we don't have any stats associated with this image, but uh, it gives you a, a visual for how things are performing. Uh, this is some work that uh, FUAD has done. There's actually been some updates to these results, but um, one of the issues is really, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, uh, the visible and infrared albedo of glaciers in uh, um, uh, Greenland and Antarctica are much uh, higher than they are for um, the Rocky Mountains, for example. So you can see that this is a simulation of the Bow River at Banff from these are average uh, daily values from 2003 to, to, to 2013. Uh, comparing uh, the observations to a number of um, uh, different model uh, simulations, simply by changing the albedos of, of the glaciers and, and by reducing the albedos um, from case zero to case five, you gradually come closer to getting this recession um, uh, more accurately represented in the model. So that's a very encouraging result. If you improve the physics in the model, you uh, should uh, improve the, the representation of the, uh, uh, of the outputs as well. And that seems to be what's happening here. So uh, some good work by Fuad uh, taking advantage of the, the, the work that um, a number of people are working on together. 
Uh, so I have mentioned mountains and mesh a couple of times. This is some of the work that Salal and Tesma really uh, spearheaded, and uh, it's a bit hard to see the hydrographs there. These um, figures just show the uh, the Bow River at, at Banff um, watershed and some of the um, uh, the, the uh, representation of the land cover and elevation within the model, and how the grouped response units were were set up based on not only land cover type, but slope and aspect, and uh, um, for uh, dealing with the, uh, uh, the the changes to the forcing data. And the results are really quite good for um, this particular basin. So that's really nice to see, and something that we didn't have available to us a couple of years ago within the modeling platform. Here's another set of results of the Lallums for the Bow River at Banff using a different uh, forcing data set. This is working with the, the Wharf uh, data set. Um, so you can see the stats for the calibration and validation periods here running the model from 2001 to 2015. Uh, and again, um, really good, good looking results from, from this work. One of the things that is really quite interesting, and this gets back to the glaciers again, um, uh, here we've got the annual mass balance of Plato uh, Plato Glacier and uh, various simulations showing the nearest group response unit and Zalalem simulations to uh, Plato Glacier. So you can see uh, the black line at the top is um, at the observations, and uh, this purple line at the bottom, which performs really poorly uh, in terms of representing Plato Glacier in particular, is from the CAN RCM4. Um, uh, data set forcing uh, the original version of MeSH that did not include these uh, mountainous processes. Uh, if you simply change the physical representation of the, of the model uh, to include these uh, mountainous processes or these processes that are really important to the mountains, you can see an improvement from the purple line to the blue line. And then when you uh, look at the, the pink line, and for me it's sort of a, a teal line, these are, uh, these are both using a different forcing data set, but with the original version of mesh, mesh that does not include these um, uh, representation of uh, processes that are important for the mountains. And then when you uh, work with either WARF or GEM and Kappa, and you're then looking at um, uh, including the, the mountain mesh in, in those simulations, you do a much, much better job of simulating the glaciers in, uh, or simulating Pato Glacier at least on an annual basis. So this is really encouraging from my perspective in terms of seeing how these improvements to the model can be applied uh, to a number of different environments um, and in environments that we typically haven't looked at. Uh, in great detail from the perspective of uh, a large-scale um, modeler. I'm going to uh, just say a few words about uh, the coupling that uh, has taken place with Carl Eric Lindenschmidt's group. So uh, they have coupled mesh with uh, rib ice to do some operational ice jam flood, for, you know, flood modeling, and uh, at the moment, uh, this slide uh, just says lower Athabasca, but I know Carl has been working with other groups to look at ice jam forecasting as well. And there's also been some significant uh, work done on the sediment and nutrient transport modeling, uh, coupling mesh with uh, sediment and nutrient transport models as well. The last point I really want to make with respect to uh, improvements is with regards to the scalability of the of the model. And this is one thing that uh, is an advantage of Mesh over Gem Hydro, for example. You can run it on a laptop if you want to, um, and in some cases that that works great. Um, you don't necessarily need a high performance computer cluster to run the model, uh, but you can also run it on a on a heavy duty workstation or a high performance computer cluster. Some of the work that Dan Prince had done um, to scale the model, and actually prior to Dan Prince, Chris, Chris uh, Marsh had done some work to help us uh, speed up the, uh, the model as well. And then Dan took the work that Chris had done and, and took it a step or two further. And we also have parallelized version of the, the code that works on multiple cores and nodes. And um, I, now we're able to run 
uh, basins like the Mackenzie River Basin um, uh, much, much faster than we were able to do before. Uh, I think there's probably still room for improvement in terms of the scalability of, of the model, but uh, uh, we are much further ahead than we were previously, which is really nice to, for us to see. This just summarizes uh, a slide that I got from, well, this is a slide I got from Dan Prince that summarizes uh, some of the modules that um, we have been working on within MeSH, not only within the current generation hydrological model of the team, but within Environment and Climate Change Canada and some uh, other work with uh, other parts of Environment Canada as well. The check marks are areas where we've um, basically check those items off uh, or tested them and then there's a few areas that remain on our to-do list to, uh, to deal with. As far as the climate change production runs, um, as uh, Prabhin mentioned, there are seven basins across the country that we're looking at, uh, at running. Uh, some of this work is really just gearing up. Um, the the places where we've done uh, the most in terms of climate change runs are on the Saskatchewan River Basin and the, and the Mackenzie, but I don't believe we're really at the point where they're really ready for uh, wider consumption just yet. Um, so I just want to do a time check here. Uh, Prabhin, uh, is, do I still have a few more minutes to, to talk or should I be wrapping up now and opening it up for more question and answer period? Uh, you still have 13 minutes. 20 minutes? Uh, 13. 13, okay, all right. Um, great, uh, so I'll start, uh, I guess, east to west. Um, so Sujata is taking up the work for the St. John River Basin, um, picking up where Brandon had left off with, uh, with Carl's group earlier. Uh, so the uh, St. John River Basin uh, straddles uh, Quebec, New Brunswick, and Maine in the United States. So it's an international transboundary basin, and uh, it's 55,000 square kilometers. Uh, there's 13 active stream uh, gauging stations, eight in Canada, five in the United States. Um, because we really don't have a way of dealing with uh, tides within the, the mesh modeling platform, the uh, setup was um, uh, uh, changed not right to the Bay of Fundy, but to uh, just uh, just past uh, Fredericton. Fredericton. So instead of modeling the full 55,000 square kilometers, uh, we're modeling just under 40,000 square kilometers. Uh, there's still some work to incorporate the uh, dams and hydraulic stru structures to regulate uh, in the regulated areas down downstream in the downstream portions of this basin. Uh, but when we look at the initial calibration and validation results for uh, one of the headwater basins, um, that it's not influenced very much by uh, human endeavors. Uh, we've got a really good starting point in terms of parameterization. Um, Although there's some uh, next steps in terms of uh, dealing with the um, the inflows and the outflows of the uh, of the dams and the reservoirs, and setting ourselves up to do the future climate change scenarios in the basin. I'm going to skip over the Great Lakes because we haven't really started that yet. But uh, Fuad has been doing some really great work. Um, uh, on the whole Nelson Churchill system, as well as the Saskatchewan River Basin system, what I'm showing here is the Nelson Churchill system. Um, that's a part of the model enter comparison project that Fuad is leading for us. Uh, this just shows some of the different land cover types in that in that basin, uh, and then how the basin looks in the the model. So uh, when you have a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer grid square, the grids look pretty small in this large area, but uh, um, this is how Green Canoe represents the, uh, the drainage area. So you can sort of see where the model thinks the, the streams are in, the, uh, in, the, in this particular basin. Um, land cover fraction, uh, it's almost a third cropland in the southern part of the basin, and then we've got some other significant land covers in the basin as well. Of course, one of the very um, important uh, things for the Saskatchewan River Basin is the uh, irrigation. So these are just a few images that Fuad provided that um, 
illustrate where irrigation is occurring or could be occurring uh, based on some of the databases that are that are available. And uh, one of the databases illustrating where some of the dams are. So there, I know the whole model injury comparison group is looking at how far uh, it, um, each of the modeling groups should, should go in terms of which dams to represent or, or not. And we're going through the same process as well. As far as the climate change simulation goes, um, it's been a bit of a back and forth process between performing climate change simulations and diagnosing what's going on and um, uh, making some model improvements. So FUAD has completed some climate change simulations here um, and then there's been some back and forth about how glaciers are represented for example and uh, whether the mountainous environments are represented properly and that sort of thing. And those are all very new developments. It's all happening real time. Uh, so we're trying to do two things, two sets of things at the same time. So that uh, just means there's a lot of back and forth between the two. Um, what you can see here, I'll just focus on the top left-hand corner for the, the North Saskatchewan River at, at Edmonton. Um, the black line represents the average uh, observed stream flow um, for an annual cycle from 1980 to 2010. Uh, 2010. The yellow lines illustrate the um, uh, the climate or the simulations using the climate change forcing for the historical time period um, for that uh, for that same time period. So you can see there are some uh, significant differences there. But when we're looking at climate change scenarios, um, really one of the more important things is what uh, the difference between historic simulations and future simulations is telling you. So. Uh, there are the orange lines that illustrate from 2025 to 2055 and then the red simulations from 2070 to 2100. So they're all 30 year time periods and um, what these climate change simulations are illustrating is that we can expect um, peaks uh, that are coming earlier for that particular gauge. So I uh, should highlight, I mean this is a work in progress so there's still um, work to be done but um, I just wanted to show that we are doing some climate change simulations and we do have some results that we're working on on refining. Uh, Mohamed El Shami is responsible for the Mackenzie River Basin and this is probably one of the most challenging basins in the world to um, uh, make predictions on. Uh, you have all sorts of issues from uh, wetlands with spill fill and spill processes, large and small lakes. Um, uh, permafrost, which is generally not well represented in, in uh, land surface schemes, and um, there's just a whole host of uh, challenges with the Mackenzie River Basin. Uh, this is just a map that illustrates uh, the, the, the Mackenzie River Basin and some of the sub-basins. Uh, the model configuration for the Mackenzie is, a, again, at about a 10-kilometer uh, grid, grid size. There's 15 grouped response units after making use of um, looking at uh, um, splitting the slopes up in some of the mountainous areas. Uh, uh, Mohammed is making use of Fuad's dynamically zoned reservoir scheme for, for Bennett Dam, uh, making use of a deep uh, soil profile. Uh, there's some calibration on the major sub-basins and again looking at permafrost and how to deal with that effectively. So when Mohammed first started with the Mackenzie, the hydrograss looked absolutely horrendous um, because we weren't representing any of these processes very well in the, in the model. And um, sorry, I'll skip over this one. This is just a slide of the, of the different uh, types of permafrost that are present in the basin. So just highlighting one of those challenges there. Um, so th those initial hydrographs when Muhammad first started where we weren't really representing any of these processes very well were terrible and now we're getting very good uh, results um, for uh, many of the sub-basins in, in this particular area. When looking at the impacts of the climate change, um, again these are some very preliminary results. Uh, you can see the, uh, the um, the historical periods that were run um, using the climate change forcing from 1980 to 2010. Again, we're looking at uh, 
a daily average over a 30-year period of the um, of the hydrograph. Uh, I'm not exactly we don't have listed where this particular hydrograph is, but um, you can see the, uh, the the it picks up the um, the snowmelt period quite well, but uh, there are some issues um, uh, with the peak itself and then and then the recession. Uh, but again, the important thing with the climate change scenarios is to see how that changes. So if we look from 2025 to 2055, where all we're changing is the forcing based on the on the climate scenarios, and then again 2070 to 2100, um, what we're what we're seeing with these initial simulations are larger peaks and earlier peaks. So we still need to scrutinize whether that holds up under um, you know, further analysis, but um, these are important implications for, for people with interest in, in these basins. And this is the sort of thing that we're looking to produce with the uh, um, deliverables for global water future and uh, global water futures for climate change scenarios. Uh, the Yukon is one that we do have set up for a, a real-time forecasting scenario, but I won't be talking about that here. But when it comes to climate change scenarios, Mohammed will be responsible for doing the climate change scenarios for the Yukon once we um, uh, get the uh, Mackenzie River runs set up. Um, I do want to say a couple of words about CRIM. Uh, this is a slide that Lo Logan had provided. Um, so uh, for the upper bow, uh, Logan is doing uh, some runs with um, uh, with wharf uh, control and pseudo global warming forcings, uh, looking at um, how the Bow River at Lake Louise and the Pipestone River at, at Lake Louise uh, perform in terms of their uh, uh, their water fluxes. So there's a, the control simulation is the reference, uh, so you can see how it um, uh, how the water fluxes are for that simulation for the, the split between snowfall, rainfall, uh, stream flow, sublimation, evapotranspiration, and blowing snow transport, and then how that can change with the pseudo global warming, both with and without glaciers. And then I'm just showing one of the, the slides here comparing the observations plus or minus one standard deviation to the simulations he had run with, with CRIM for the Pipestone River near Lake Louise. Um, again, comparing to the observations with the simulations. Uh, Logan had provided four slides. I just wanted to show the one that I think was one of the ones that showed the closest um, uh, between the observations and, and the simulations. So, some really great work uh, that Logan's doing with uh, with CRIM in this area. As far as future directions, um, I think we do need to have a bit of further discussion, both with the faculty leads and the HQP, with respect to the modeling approaches that we want to take for these climate change uh, production runs. Uh, of course, we want to continue evaluating and improving uh, the models. Uh, I think we need to develop a bit of a publication strategy around um, the work that we're doing because uh, I think we suffer a little bit from what all of us suffer from to some degree, which is scope creep. We often find new and interesting things and uh, before we wrap up the previous task, we start on the next task and um, I think we need to take a look at uh, what we're doing with respect to our publications and um, develop a bit of a strategy around that. Um, just to wrap up, I'm going to end with this slide. I think um, this is a, uh, comes from a publication that Martin Clark uh, led and uh, was published in 2016 and uh, really talks about characterizing, characterizing and reducing uncertainties and coming up with hydrological storylines for um, uh, climate change simulations. So uh, I won't get into the details, uh, just to say that um, I think we have a really good template that we can work with in terms of how we develop our climate change scenarios going forward, uh, given the work that we have done to date. So I'll end it there. And um, I see a number of questions have been coming through. Uh, I haven't had a look at them yet, but I'll pass it back to you, Prabhin, to um, uh, I guess help us navigate the questions. Thank you, Bruce. Uh...
So one of the questions that we have is uh, how does the hype model it fit into the into the your the, some of the work that you have been doing? Yes. Okay. I didn't really mention hype very much, but uh, hype is uh, one of the models that we are working with within this group. So that is under. Uh, uh, Trish Stadnick at the University of Calgary. Uh, so one of the current generation modeling team members is a student working with Trish uh, with Hype, uh, particularly in the Fraser River Basin. Um, I would also say that there's a number of uh, collaborators that we're working with on the, uh, the Hype model in terms of uh, model intercomparison project, for example. Um, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the work that we're doing with HYPE, um, the, the idea is to have some climate change production runs coming from a number of different models and HYPE is, is one of those models. So there might be some further definition that's required in terms of, uh, of the work with HYPE, but that's how, that's how I characterize it at the moment. Thanks. Uh, there is also another question from Jim, and and he's wondering uh, in some of the presentation that we said today, there were a lot of these uncertainty bounds in the simulation results. So he was wondering if these uncertainties are from the you know forcing data or moral parameters or how you guys are uh, characterizing the uncertainty in your simulation. Yeah, that's a really good question, um, and I think it's something that as a group we need to have a more fulsome discussion around. Um, at the moment, the uncertainty characterization is really related to the forcing. So if we look at this particular graph here, it's, it's, it's uh, a set of forcing that comes from uh, the uh, CAN RCM4 climate model that has been bias corrected and downscaled to a product called Lofty Gem Kappa. And uh, so it kind of incorporates uh, uncertainty with one climate model and the initial conditions around that climate model and some of the downscaling methodology that we've used within that climate model. Uh, when um, we come to produce our final climate change production runs for GWF, uh, it seems to me that we need to take a closer look at um, ensuring that we incorporate the range of uncertainty that uh, exists um, uh, within the modeling, uh, the cascade of, of modeling that occurs within this type of framework and then looking at what we can do to reduce some of those uncertainties. And that is happening to some degree at the moment, but um, I think we need to have a consistent strategy across all seven basins that we're, we're, that we're working with to, to do that effectively. So stay tuned, I guess, is the, is the final answer on that question. Uh, just a follow-up question on that one. Uh, how many ensembles of climate runs uh, are you including on that, uh, on that simulation? There are 15, so it's really based on um, uh, perturbations to the initial conditions to CAN RCM4, which uh, were then bias corrected and, and, and downscaled. So there's 15 simulations that were used in that range of uncertainty that was uh, illustrated in these slides. Uh, we have another question from Nassim, and she's wondering. Uh, if there has been any work done to link uh, agriculture non-point source model and mess, uh, uh, this model was previously linked with water flood, so uh, so coupling should be fairly easier. But uh, has then has there been any work or any plan to do that work? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it uh, there there could be. Um, I think that's something that we uh, we'd have to have another discussion around and get back. Uh, the, the focus is really on the stuff that I have presented today. There are other other focal areas as well, but that's one that uh, there very well may be other researchers working on those sorts of activities. MESH is a community-based model and GWF is really the biggest player right now, but um, uh, it's entirely possible that there's other um, similar work going on along those lines, but uh, I'd certainly welcome suggestions like that through an email or a follow up. Uh, that's something that we can discuss with uh, with the other the other leads for the current generation modeling group and see if there's room to do that or whether we just uh, make sure we check off the boxes we need to check off and save that for something in the future. Uh, thanks. 
uh, Jim also adding some point on the previous conversation and he's saying that uh, they have done similar work with the RCM in the UK and running the simulation all across the UK, uh, including climate model symbol and uncertainties in the hydrological modeling. So it could be some, some, uh, some interest for this group. So maybe you guys can uh, connect after the call and talk more about it. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Please send me an email and uh, we'll see if there's uh, a path forward. Um, also, it, it seems from your presentation that the mess is now evolving more from a model to being a more like a modeling platform where you can couple and decouple a lot of processes uh, or how they are represented. So is, is that where we are heading, you know, having a more kind of flexible modeling platform instead of being uh, just in one model? Yeah, I'd say we're already there. Um, mesh isn't really just a model anymore, but we're not the only models that are evolving in this way. So there's uh, um, uh, certainly we're uh, in a position and we were provided some of that direction from Howard Weider under the Global Institute for Water Security to ensure that we made the model more modular. And uh, that, that was one of the first jobs that Dan Prince came, did when he came on board. Um, also within Environment and Climate Change Canada, the fact that we now have the capabilities of working with uh, two different land surface schemes, one that is more geared towards climate simulations and one that is more geared towards short-term uh, simulations uh, does take us more into that territory of not just being a model, but actually being a modeling platform where you can do a better job of mixing and matching. Um, depending on what the problem is that you're wanting to look at. Thank you. So uh, I don't think we have more question on the questions here, uh, but I just have a follow-up question on what we discussed before is, so a uh, lot of times when you are talking about these uh, future climate simulations and about uncertainties and most of the focus has been on the meteorological forcing on data because that's that's where the most of the uncertainties are coming from and very less on you know like how do we transfer parameters into the future climate scenario because they are not trained for that climate conditions because they are trained from the historic conditions and also how do we get the uh, future data for a land use change and other this kind of stuff. So, uh, has there been any thought, or have you guys any you know thought about this, like where to get this data, or if that that's going to be the part uh, included in the future simulation, or is it just based on the uh, climate change uh, scenario from these uh, downscale data? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Certainly on the on the, the land use change, there has been some work done on on that front. Um, I know Alan Barr did uh, quite a bit of work on uh, looking at um, you know what land, what the land use or the land cover types might be into the into the future. Uh, that is that's part of the discussion that we need to have with the group before we dive too much further into our climate change simulations, uh, making sure that we are characterizing land to use change as a, as one of the uncertainties that is inevitable in this sort of exercise. Uh, and the parameterization as well. I mean, that's another really important one. Uh, if there's large scale drainage that occurs across some of these prairie watersheds, uh, that's certainly going to have an impact on our model simulation. So, um, in some ways, we can't get around some of these issues because we don't know what the future holds. I mean, if you were to ask me a year ago that we would all be under lockdown because of a pandemic, I mean, uh, pandemics, I guess, are like floods. They happen from time to time, but uh, the reality is these sorts of things are very difficult to predict. So um, those are issues that we do need to consider and uh, are part of the, the discussions and the strategies that we're, we're having and, and developing. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we, we are thinking about those things, um, but uh, I mean, whether or not we get them totally right, that's something that time will tell. Uh, so, so one of the focus also has been on providing support for for moral support to other gold water future groups and other projects. So, uh, are you also open to provide this support to the people outside the gold water future, or is mainly uh, aimed uh, for the other gold water future groups? 
Yeah, so the the support is really split between Environment and Climate Change Canada and Global Water Futures. So uh, Dan Prince was working for the Global Institute for Water Security, and he was providing a lot of support um, to the Global Water Futures community. He now works for Environment and Climate Change Canada and is the primary support person outside of the Global Water Futures community. Uh, he was the primary support person for the Global Water Futures folks as well, but um, uh, now that we hired Ala partly to fill that gap, so he'll be the first line of um, defense for Global Water Futures folks. Um, for people who are not a part of Global Water Futures, myself and Dan are still the first uh, points of contact. Uh, so we have another question from Martin and uh, he, he's asking, can you summarize some of, some of your biggest uh, science challenges in developing MESS? Sorry, some of the biggest challenges? Science challenges in developing MISS? Sure. Um, okay, science challenges, right. Um, because there's lots of challenges that I would say aren't related to the, to the science, um, which are, are more around uh, the idea that we're actually developing software here and we're developing software with people who aren't experts at developing software. So there's a whole series of challenges around that that are really um, often neglected and, and, and that's a huge challenge in itself. But as far as science challenges go, um, in my mind it comes down to the fact that we're, uh, we're really blending the work that comes from a number of different communities. So uh, the Canadian Land Surface Scheme, for example, as I was mentioning in the presentation, was initially developed as a lower boundary condition for the atmospheric modelers. So it was really focused on what atmospheric modelers were interested in, which is not the same thing as what hydrologists are interested in. There's overlap for sure, um, but the focus is a little bit different. So trying to take the, the best of not only hydrological science and building it into the models um, with people who are not necessarily software uh, model developers, but also um, taking the best of hydrological modeling concepts and combining them with um, uh, the best of the, the concepts that are a part of these land surface schemes um, has been a challenge because often what happens is you have uh, different communities of people develop different languages for basically the same concepts. So often you'll be at workshops or conferences and people will be talking about exactly the same thing but using different words to describe the same processes. Um, and first of all, realizing that that's the case. And then secondly, uh, coming to some sort of consensus and uh, path forward in terms of how to take the best of uh, these different communities and building them together into a single model or a single modeling platform that can be used for different purposes. Um, that's a, I, I, I'd consider that a, a, a science challenge. Um, certainly when you look at the details, uh, prairie hydrology is extremely complicated. How you deal with small and large lakes, um, permafrost, uh, wetlands is a nut that we have not really cracked yet, I think, because there's so many different types of wetlands. Um, and again, some of that comes to this different communities. A lot of these issues have been studied in great detail by the process hydrologist, and they've come up with um, very good component models for dealing with these things. Uh, but then taking those ideas and transferring them into these large scale models and it's challenging, um, and I'd call that a, a scientific challenge in itself. And it seems to me we're finally at the point where we're starting to look at that in a more collaborative way than we have in the past. Uh, I think uh, that was the last question for today. And thank you, Bruce, for your time. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I also want to thank everybody uh, who, who attended this, uh, this webinar. And also want to say, stay tuned for the future webinars. Uh, that will be all for today. Uh, Bruce, do you have any last words? No, again, thank you, Pravin. And thank you for everybody for organizing this and for attending. I know it's a busy time and there's lots of uh, competition for webinars and uh, Zoom sessions these days. So appreciate you joining uh, the presentation today. And certainly feel free to contact me if you have any questions or comments. Thank you. Uh, goodbye, everyone. Uh, see you next month.